Good morning. My name is Noah Chalaya. I, uh, if you haven't, if you don't recognize the sound of my voice, I uh, host a weekly talk radio show called the Ask Noah Show, and I am the owner of Alta Speed Technologies, and we're a contract <coughs> IT. Uh, MSP. And so essentially what that means, if you're not familiar with the term, is that there are places like small hospitals or small law offices that employ us to manage their IT infrastructure because it's more cost effective to do that on a contract rate than it is to have full-time IT staff. In 2009, the reason that we started AltaSpeed Technologies was because we experienced with other companies that if you utilized open source, you could provide a creative cost-saving solution to the customer without sacrificing any quality. And that's not, when I say that, it's not a line, it's not a brochure filler, it's not something that we, we just stick up on the website because we needed to replace uh, Laura Ipsum, right? That's a actual core belief, that we really believe that if you utilize open source technology, that there, is, there are creative ways to solve the exact same problems that people solve with proprietary solutions, but we can do that at a cost savings with higher quality of code, more security, more stability, all of the reasons that you're probably here at Linux Fest. <clears throat> now, I want to be clear on what this talk isn't. This isn't the kind of talk where we, I, I tell you, um, here are the, you know, here are, here are some ideas of how you can go about uh, selling yourself in an open source world or, or um, how can you go about selling your software or anything like that. It's not, it's not a sales lesson. Really what it is is uh, a collection of hard-earned life lessons uh, going through this myself because one of the issues you face, and it's important to remember anytime you're pitching any product or service, free and open source or otherwise, people tend to don't value something that doesn't have a price tag on it. And so when you tell people that you have an alternative to their $5,000 Cisco network appliance, and you tell them that this free alternative will provide the same VoIP calling functionality, in fact, actually more VoIP calling uh, functionality as their $5,000 Cisco system, and then on top of that you tell them that there is no yearly maintenance fee, there is no subscription free, when they ask, where is that software and how do I get it, and you tell them I downloaded it off the internet, it tends to have kind of a weird feel to it, right? I went on the internet, I found this thing, and I downloaded it, and I want to put it into your production system. So it's important if you are going, if you're considering going into open source, or if you're in open source, and you're trying to work in a business environment, that you're paying attention to the fact uh, that people put a value, right or wrong, based on, on, on the price tag you put it on. So what did we do? What we did was we arbitrarily assigned value to given uh, projects, charge the client, take that money, and donate it right back to the developer. Now, the interesting thing is, I t I, uh, sometimes I will say that in a room, and I'm guessing it's because it's 9 in the morning and most of us would rather be in bed right now, but it, it, sometimes I will say that and people laugh at it like it's kind of funny, like, oh, that's, that's amusing and clever, right? The reality is I'm following the exact same developer workflow that you, that a developer would expect to be followed and expect to be paid if he or she worked on a, on a project instead of out of passion, but to collect a paycheck. And I think sometimes as stewards of the open source community, we forget that there are real people attached to those projects and they have lives and bills to pay and food to put on their table. And just because you were able to go out to the internet and download something at no cost to you doesn't mean that it didn't co come at a cost to somebody else. And so oftentimes when I say things, when I open a, when I open a presentation with, uh, we provide these things at a cost saving to the client, people go, they, they think to themselves, oh yeah, because open source money, or open source software doesn't cost money. And I want to be clear, that's not the case. It absolutely costs money, it's just most time being donated to you by the good graces of the developer or the people that work on it because they're passionate about it. And if we want to keep them passionate and keep them involved and keep them developing the software, then we need to give them money for what they do. And it's important, no matter what side of that equation you're on, whether you're on the side of you're trying to charge people for money, or charge money for the thing that you're doing, or if you're trying to give money back to a project, the first thing we all have to agree on is that making money is an okay thing to do. Charging people money for something in exchange for a good product or service 
is perfectly acceptable. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not immoral. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to be scared of. It's something to embrace. And so often, I will come across business owners and I will have a conversation with them and they'll say, I can't figure out what my problem is. I have an issue and I, 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 I seem to hit this hurdle or I've hit a plateau and I don't know how to grow my business. <clears throat> and what you find is when you're just sitting down and talking to these people, what you find is they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed of their own business. They're embarrassed because they don't believe that they, they command the amount of money that they charge or that they should be charging because they didn't maybe pay for the software that they're installing. Good. Yeah. yeah, in fact, <clears throat> to your point, it's a great question, to your point, say again, the, the, the question was, was simply this, is does artificially imposing a cost on a product or service increase its perceived value? And the, abs the answer to that is absolutely yes. And a perfect example of what you're talking about is we were, de we were developing, I shouldn't say developing, but we were finding ways to creatively utilize uh, Linux ISOs to install on guest kiosk machines that we put inside of hospitality places, venues. And so we would put these computers in, and instead of charging them a thousand bucks for a Windows machine with site kiosk and all the licensing and deep freeze and all the other crap you got to put on it to make sure that, it, that Windows doesn't choke to death, what we found was when we pitched this free alternative, people were immediately skeptical. As soon as we added a $200 price tag or a $300 price tag, now people thought, oh, they found us a deal. We were spending $700 before, now we're getting it for three or 400, that's a deal. And to the small Linux distribution that we, we use to, to base that software off of, those guys were thrilled because now there's money and funding their develop, some of their development costs and stuff like that, and picking up some of their hosting. And as thank you for the fact that we are now able to use their, their product to, 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 to make something appear more valuable to the customer. Does that adequately answer your question? And if anybody else has questions, uh, feel free to fling them at me as we go on. No need to wait for the end. So when, if you believe in what you're doing and you believe something is moral and right and okay to make money, you stand a better chance of success. The P, you can always tell somebody who is proud of the work they're doing, and this is a great place to make this example, right? Because everybody here... If you're at this conference, chances are the vast majority of you are passionate about something, some project. And whatever that project is, as you bump into people in the hall, you almost wear it like a badge of honor. And you'll say, I work for, or I work with, or I develop with, or I am part of, and it becomes a part of your identity because you're so enthusiastic about that product or that service. And whether you know it or not, it makes you a good salesperson. What makes a poor salesperson is the, what we call the shame reflex, or when somebody is embarrassed uh, or, or, uh, or, or feels shame for the product or service. And this is why the most successful business people uh, believe in the product or service that they sell. And the ones that don't, don't make it very far at all. Uh, at at Altaspeed Technologies, we carry a large range of hardware products and software that we install and support. And... Every one of those pieces of software, every one of those pieces of hardware are in, sitting inside of my house even when they're not practical to sit inside of my house. We have a, uh, an access control system. And I've, I've told this story on my talk radio show a couple of times of my wife getting locked out uh, with our proximity ID door system, access control system. And that system does not belong in a residential house. But the reason it's there is because before I was willing to put our name on it and before I was willing to tell customers that they should spend thousands of dollars to have us come out and install this, I wanted to see how it worked for myself. <clears throat> Developers, and what, this is why I'm so, so passionate about Linux on the desktop, Developers fix problems when they come into an itch, when they come into something that bothers them. And you can take that same principle and apply it to your own business. And in our case, I take hardware and, and try it out. And that, there's, there's another point in there too, and that is this. Even if you work for someone else, people that are successful take ownership of their own job. And so when you talk to people, uh, one of the things that you will hear, and I hear it all the time, and I say, what do you do? And they say, I work for X. 
That doesn't tell me what you do. That tells me who you work for. And if the most interesting thing about you is that you work for somebody else, well, frankly, I'd rather talk to them. When somebody asks what you do, take ownership of that, chart, or of that job. And it doesn't matter if you own the company or not. Take ownership of that job. I'm a software developer who writes code. I am a person who helps businesses connect with their solutions. Whatever the, whatever the answer is, define what you do and talk about that. Be an advocate and go out and, and advocate for yourself. And if you own a business, then you advocate, of course, for your, your business. When you go out to talk to, to uh, clients, excuse me, when you go out and talk to clients, they can smell desperation. And that was one of the things I learned the hard way early on. It wasn't because I was embarrassed uh, of the products or service we were selling. I was confident in their quality. I was just nervous and new and didn't really know what I was doing and couldn't figure out why I couldn't make sales. And part of that is, well, because I'm not a salesperson, I don't have a sales background. Um, but when you're a small business owner, you start out as the receptionist, the janitor, the salesperson, the service technician, the phone technician, the IT repair guy, the plumber. And, you know, and so you're doing one of those, hey, thanks for calling. Uh, we'll get a technician right out. I have to go right out. You know, oh, now I'm going to send the bill. You know, you're doing it all yourself. Um, and, when, and I couldn't figure it out. Later on, what I learned is when I was confident and I was comfortable and I was okay with not making a sale, I didn't need to make the sale, all of a sudden, it's much easier to make sales. Why is that? Desperation smells. People can tell when you're desperate to try to get them to spend money, and that makes them nervous, as it should, because your motivation is split, right? <clears throat> Starvation is a powerful motivator, and if they can tell that you're in trouble if you don't make that sale, there is the, the, the preconception, probably somewhat accurate, that you're going to try to push that sale whether or not it's in the client's best interest. And so what we have is a breakdown of trust. And trust is, oops, I got out of order. Um, where preparation meets opportunity. Now this is sometimes a, uh, a quote uh, associated with Zig Ziglar. Um, there's actually somebody that said it before him and then Zig Ziglar changed it to success is where preparation meets opportunity. I was in a sandwich shop and I was uh, going through it. I was unhappy to be in this particular sandwich shop because I don't like anything they have. But it was my father-in-law's birthday, and he asked if we could go to the sandwich shop. <clears throat> and when I, the thing about me is I am, I'm generally pretty easygoing until I get pushed into something that I vocalized <clears throat> multiple times that I really don't want to do, and then I become kind of a jerk. So I'm in there, and I'm like, I don't want anything. I'm not hungry. And I'm, I'm standing in line, and this guy who's a very nice 17, 18-year-old kid, goes, good afternoon, sir, what can I get you? I don't want anything. Everything you have sucks. <laughs> and he kind of looks at me and goes, I think we have some good food. Good for you. You eat it. I'm not hungry. <clears throat> he goes, well, how about this? No. How about this? No. And I, I can't figure out why this idiot won't leave me alone. I don't want a stupid sandwich. I just want to be left alone. I want to sulk, and I want to make an idiot out of myself inside of this. Just leave me alone, right? <clears throat> so I, I'm standing here. Being, just being a jerk, right? Because I just want to be left alone. And the kid tells me, all right, here's the sandwich you need. And he, he, he starts selling me on the sandwich, right? That it has this kind of meat and it has that kind of cheese and it is made with this kind of bread and it's so great. And I, I take these things home. I buy two of them. I take one home and I, whatever. I'm thinking, as he's describing it, I'm like, ah, it doesn't sound as bad as I thought. I start thinking. Finally, I'm like, you know what? He's been talking about this for five minutes. I guess I have to figure out what the stupid thing is about and see if it's actually worth it. So I buy the stupid sandwich. As he's ringing me up, I look up and realize that is the most expensive sandwich on the entire menu in a restaurant I didn't want to eat at in the first place. <laughs> so he finishes checking me out, and I looked up at him. I said, what's your plans in this, in this, in this tiny little sandwich shop? He goes, well, I'm considering doing door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner sales. And I went... Well, that makes sense. You're a good salesperson. I said, tell you what. And I gave him my card, and I said, call me. I said, let's, let's I, I know you got a vacuum cleaner, a budding vacuum cleaner, you know, uh, 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 entrepreneurship uh, coming up, but I want to make you a better deal. Come chat with me. Come into my office. One of the best sales guys we've ever had, right? And the reason he got that job was because he was going to be the best damn sandwich salesman money could buy for $8.95. You know, but because that was his, if he was going to do it, he was going to do it well. And the point there is this. There are so many people, and I meet them, and they tell me, 
No, I just need I just I need the right opportunity, and then then I'm going to I'm gonna I, I put all my effort in. But right now I, I'm so beat down by my job, and I just have no passion and no motivation. And guess what? We don't hire people that don't have passion and motivation. If you come into my office and you're like I'm burnt out, I don't want you working for me, because it's much easier to redirect somebody who already has energy and passion than it is to try to kick a donkey and and get them to move right. Uh, this kid was, was doing his best at, at this store, and he had a natural sales skill that apparently nobody else in that restaurant had noticed before I walked in. Thank God for me. But, the, but as we walked in there, and I saw what he was doing, I couldn't help but make him an offer. And he, I promise you, he's making a lot more money than he's making at the sandwich place, right? So all of this comes down to trust. And Trust is the same reason why that kid got me to buy that sandwich, because he, he, he showed himself to be an authority on that sandwich. And so if he believed in that sandwich and he trusted that that was a good sandwich to eat, <clears throat> that couldn't help but spread to me, and I was willing to spend money that I was absolutely dead set against spending when I walked in because I trusted this kid, right? Ended up being a great sandwich. I haven't gone back to the sandwich shop since, but if I did, I know what sandwich I would get. Trust can't be purchased. And this is what is so frustrating to people that want to do a business out of, or out of a desire for money instead of a passion. And again, <clears throat> I want to reiterate, very first slide, right? Making money is not immoral. I don't believe that. I think making money is a perfectly moral, correct, right thing to do. That said, if you're motivated by the wrong things, it tends to blow up in your face. And so I get people all the time, they say, I want to take out a $50,000 business loan, and I want to buy big signs, and I want to buy big shirts, and I want to buy this, and I want to buy that. And you've spent three years for a, for a company that has never made you a dime. Why do you want to do that? Well, because it will be professional, and it will brand me. And really what they're saying, they don't know it, but really what they're saying is, I want to purchase trust. I want to spend $50,000 jump-starting my business because I believe it's going to purchase me trust and trust will lead to sales. And what I'm here to tell you is trust can't be bought. You cannot purchase it. There's no amount of money that you can spend on it. And part, we have part of that to thank to all of your phones that go off all the time with these stupid uh, uh, spam robocallers, right? There was a time where if you got a call and the caller ID matched the, your bank and you got a call and they had a professional voice and they, you, know, you would start to think, Hey, maybe this is actually my bank. Now, us in this room, as a lot of us are security people, probably just hung up on the, the poor person and then called our bank back, and then the same person answers you like, oh, sorry. Uh, but, but at its heart, it's a trust issue. And what, what happens when you earn a client's trust? You get decision power. One of the things that I have learned to do is fire clients before we ever hire them. And so when you sit down with a client, a lot of people look at their business as, I just need clients because that's how I make money and that's how the world goes around. And the truth of the matter is, be selective of the clients that you take on because you want it to be a two-way fit. And if you can make it a two-way fit, uh, you stand to make more money, you stand to be happier in what you're doing, and you're more effective. The, the, the last... I used to tell people when we started, when we hit, uh, we were approaching our 10-year anniversary, and for 10 years, uh, or at least eight of them, I would always tell people I was so proud of the fact that in, since 2009, AltaSpeed has never lost a client. Since the day we went into business, if we walked into a business and we took over their IT infrastructure, they never let us go. And I was so proud of that. I thought that was the coolest statistic ever, that when they came in, we could treat them so well and give them a better deal and make things work so well that they, they would never part with us. And what I realized after five, six, seven years of doing it, I'm not exactly sure when, when this change happened. It was kind of a gradual thing. At some point, I was like, but now we have clients that we, we end up doing things that we are not meant to do as a company. because And, and the whole reason is just to, re, just to retain that stupid statistic. And it's an, it is a stupid statistic. And it's an idiotic metric of success. You're, you're, don't worry about keeping every client you've ever had. Don't worry about taking every client that walks through your door. Take the ones that you can provide the most value to because in the end, that's what's going to give them the highest return on their investment and that's what gives you the highest return on, on the work you're doing. When we sit down with clients, one of the questions I ask them is, what are you looking for in an IT service provider? And if they say, 
Well, here's our checklist of the machines that we have, and here's the model you buy, and here's the software you install, and here's the date that you install it, and here's when you do updates, and here's when you take it down, and here's when you do backups. And I say, you know what? It sounds like you got it handled. Hire, a, hire an IT guy or hire a different firm. If we come in, we need to be able to have a two-way communication. It's not a dictatorship. It's not I come in and just tell you how your IT infrastructure is going to run, but we get input. We get to say, hey, have you considered this solution? Have you looked at the software? Have you heard about the... Our, our, our Lord and Savior Linus Torvalds. You know, if, if I can't be, if that is not a conversation that we can have, <clears throat> you always have the right to say no. You always have the right to say that's not the direction that we're going to go in our company. You can say that, but we need to be, at least be able to have the conversation. And so we're not robotic hands. We're consultants, right? Um, the whole thing with great power comes great responsibility. When you get, when you earn your client's trust, what you will find is you find yourself in an incredible position of power. I work for some very awesome people that never want to talk to me, and I'm okay with that. I understand. They're busy, and they've got things to do, and there's a particular law firm, and they have offices all over uh, the Midwest, and the owner, as you might imagine, is insanely busy, and so it's not uncommon for me to call him if I have to call him, and I try to keep that to a minimum. Hey, we need this piece of equipment, it's $15,000, you want to buy it, yes or no? Yes. Does it solve a problem? Usually is a question. Yes? Okay, buy it. And that's all he wants to, that's all he wants to hear. He just wants to send the bill in the mail, uh, but get the problem fixed. And, uh, and I've learned over time with him, there's a threshold that he doesn't want to be bothered under. Uh, and, and that's great. I'm perfectly fine doing that. On the other side of the spectrum, we have, I, ha I, j I just was chatting at a guy from, with uh, Linux Fest Northwest, <clears throat> and I was out in the parking lot, I was having a conversation with him, and he said, kind of sheepishly, I want to hire you guys to do some IT work, but I kind of have a weird request. I said, what's that? He said, well, I would like you to show me how to do it so that I can manage my own IT infrastructure. Is that weird? I said, not at all. We're not a vendor lock-in. Our contracts, we want to re-earn your, uh, your business. We want to make sure that we're adding value. At the point, if you can manage your IT infrastructure yourself and you have the money to do so and you have the time to do so, by all means, do it. We will help you, we'll help you make that transition. And so what we did, the agreement that, hi that him and LTSB Technologies reached, was we uh, essentially set up a thing where he said, all right, when you ask us to do work, you get a choice. Do you want us to outline the steps we would take and then you try to do them and then if something goes wrong, let us know and we'll step in and fix it? Or do you want us to set the whole thing up and then give you instructions of how we did that and then you can try it? And, uh, and so he said, well, I, I want to set it up myself and then I want you to double check everything. So that's fine. Now, does he pay us for that? Yes. But in the long run, is he kind of getting a free IT education on top? Uh, and he's a smart guy, right? I mean, he's at a Linux Fest. Uh, he's getting a free IT education on top of his consulting services? Yes, he is. And in four or five years, is he going to be at a point where he can do everything himself? Maybe. And that's an okay thing. The, the point is to align your interest with their interest. And uh, I, I mentioned this in my talk yesterday or Friday, and I'll mention it again today. ProtonMail is a great example of a company that aligns its interests with its customers' interests. The same thing that, that, that motivates and excites the people that work at ProtonMail are the same thing that excites and motivates its users to spend money with them. So how do you, how do you earn trust with a client if it can't be purchased? Well, there's a couple of things you can do, right? You can give a demo of your product or service. You can walk into a place and say, hey, I understand, because it's a, it is a daunting thing as a business owner to walk into a business and say, hey, I understand that you have somebody managing your IT. I want to make you a better deal. And to be honest with you, cold, cold calling probably has, I think, like an 11% close uh, ratio. So the chances of you actually making sales, do it's not an effective sales method. But every once in a while, you want to get rid of a competitor. Or every once in a while, there's just something that you're like, that would look good to have to be able to say that we do that place. And so we'll do it and say, listen, what do we have to do? Give me a number. Um, Give a demo of your product or services, especially if you're starting out. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, you know, we just started up here. We're local inside of the area. Uh, I just wanted to drop off a couple cards and give you a complimentary, you know, four hours of, of free troubleshooting. And uh, give us a shot. I think what you, I think you'll like what you find. You'll find that after you hire us, you won't be able to get rid of us because you're going to be that happy with the service. Give a, give a demo. <clears throat> one of the things, one of the sales tactics that we use all the time. We sell access points. And, and Wi-Fi systems for hotels, right? 
And oftentimes, they'll, there's, there's all of these fly-by-night installers. They come in, they throw a couple access points in the ceiling, they walk out never to be heard from again. And it has made hotel owners very, very nervous and very reluctant to enter into to, to service agreements to, to provide this stuff, right? And so one of the sales tactics we use is we say, hey, listen, let us come in, we'll do the install for free. After 90 days, if everything is working fine, we'll send you a bill in the mail. If after 90 days, you're unhappy with anything for any reason, Call us, we'll come pick the stuff up and be on our way and put all whatever you had up there before and you'll be on your way. To date, we have never once had a hotel call us back and say, yeah, come pick up your stuff and get out. Because once they find out that, hey, that, all of that stuff actually works, that's really great. He provided the service he said he was going to provide. Our, our guests are not complaining. They have internet. It works well. Then they look and go, well, that's a small price to pay. And what it does is it earns you the trust for the next time you want to make a sale, you won't have to give away a free demo, right? The next time you go to make the sale, for your initial investment of, in our case, you know, a couple thousand bucks in access points, for that initial investment, the next, when they want to buy a $5,000 server, a $10,000 server, who do you think they're going to call because we've established trust? Second thing, talk is cheap. I know a lot of consultants out there that charge every time they pick up the phone. And more power to you if you have gotten to a point in your career where you're that valuable and, and answering the phone commands a, 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 a certain rate, by all means, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're starting out, one of the things that you can do is be the guy that answers the phone. Be the guy that's willing to talk. I was trying to get some landscaping done on my house. I must have called seven different local businesses to try to get a quote to come do some landscaping. I can't get anybody to call me back. Nobody will even call me back to find out what I want to do. And, and we have had people, we've gotten clients that we've gotten the phone call. They say, hey, it's Saturday. Our XYZ place that we usually call is closed. Could you come out and help us? Well, guess what happens? Couple, enough times of that happening, and they go, well, why wouldn't we just go with the people that always answer the phone 24-7, 365, right? Be available. Be willing to answer the phone. And if, if you get that client that wants to have, you know, 45-minute conversations about, you know, and he essentially wants you to do remote troubleshooting, put up a boundary. But if it's just somebody saying, hey, I, you know, I, I want you to stop over. I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. We have this problem. Could you, could you talk a little bit about a solution or could we visit about a solution? Um, <clears throat> I will usually, because we've gotten to the point we do this, I'll just say, sure, tell you what, where would you like to go I'll take you out for lunch somewhere? And then the company takes them out for lunch, and that's a really informal, nice way to have a conversation and, and, uh, and fix their problem. Part of that is owning their problem. When they can tell that you have come alongside them and you care about the problem the way that they care about the problem, and you start to show an active interest in their business, all of a sudden, again, that does a lot to reinforce trust. When I go into a hotel, I am not above, uh, if, if a guest comes up and says, hey, I need a towel, and the, the, the front desk clerk is on the phone, I can walk five feet and grab a towel and hand it to the guest, right? That guest is waiting there, and while you're standing in front of their desk, nobody reads your shirt. Nobody understands that you're separated from that business. And so I, I have no problem helping out inside of a business if I'm paid to be on site to begin with and show that I have an active interest in that business's success. It's not, that's your problem, you do your thing, I'm here to, I'm here to fix the computer and I'm out, right? Take an active interest in the problem. And when you do that, one, you'll find, I think you find more enjoyment in the work because you get to know the people, you get to know the business, it's, it's a fun experience. But the other thing is it reinforces the idea of trust. One thing I see from, and this is what, I think if I was to give one thing that let us be successful over our competition, it is this one thing. A lot of IT companies are willing to are essentially approach the market with what they can sell. What, can I, what product can I pull off the, 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 the product shelf and, and, and pitch it to a client? And Jim Salter is an excellent example of what I'm about to talk about because Jim didn't buy a solution off the shelf and, 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 and resell it to a customer. He built something. He took existing technology and combined things together to create a unique product or service that the client values. And when you can do that, you can show that, first of all, you get more control over your costs, right? Because you can swap out individual components uh, to, to adjust to your profit margin and a shifting market and needs and all that stuff. But the other side of that is you are unique and you offer something over your competition. When Ubiquity came out, and Ubiquity is the company that is running all the network equipment here itself. When they first came out, I was working in IT. Everybody laughed at the idea that you were going to buy these stupid $90 access points and they were going to compete with our $600 Cisco's, you know, or your $700 Ruckus. 
And now what we have found is we've switched entirely over to Unify. And unless you have a massive, massive, massive deployment that requires some very, very, very specific uh, special Wi-Fi challenges, 99% of the time, those UAPAC pros, or even, or even better, the HDs, will cover you 100%. And the controller runs on Linux, which means you can manage uh, uh, multi-sites on, on, on a single controller. It's not like the, the Marikai crap where you have to register for an account and pay your yearly ransom to keep your Wi-Fi up and running, which I find to be ridiculous. Um, absolutely a quality product. But you have to be agile enough to say, I want to build something rather than buy something. It doesn't have to come off the shelf. Same thing with Asterix, right? I was talking about VoIP earlier. Same thing. It, if you, you're, you're taking a, in that case, it's more of a plug and play thing, but you're still combining technologies to build something of value to the client. Does anybody have any questions? So that means one of two things. Either I've explained everything so perfectly that nobody dare challenge me, or two, I have bored you all to death and everybody's asleep. Very well, a split, right? If you have organizations that have been penalized or organizations that are subject to being penalized for data privacy breaches, uh, it's huge. Baking industry, healthcare, and law offices, they really, really care where their data is. Um, everybody else doesn't pay a lot of attention to it, to be honest with you. To throw them a bone in their direction, that's why I have a job, right? If they wanted to be concerned about where their data was storaged or stored and what the, is Dropbox a better solution than purchasing a $5,000 server, if they wanted to, to, to dig into that decision to the depth that, it, that you really should dig into a decision like that before you spend money, um, they probably wouldn't need an IT contract firm. So to a certain degree, they offload that decision to us and just say, hey, what do you think is best? Now, we're the kind of company that we just don't believe in hosting on some other product or service, with maybe the exception of G Suite, uh, because if you need to drop an exchange replacement, I don't know of another one. But, uh, the, but as far as where actual data goes, uh, it totally depends on the industry. What we have told clients is everything that you can keep off of any sort of cloud system, you should absolutely do that. And if you want to do cloud-based stuff, own that infrastructure. And of course, we're happy to manage those servers for them, right? Uh, open source systems for what? <clears throat> oh, sure, manage. Uh, uh, so, um, well, let's start with tickets. So we do managed IT services, so we use OS Ticket, and OS Ticket is one of the most underrated projects that's out there because it has a lot of the features, not all of them, but it has a lot of the features that the, that the big proprietary alternatives do, um, but the, you can, you can self-host it, you can run it yourself, you can, and the, the API lies it tied into a ton of stuff, so that's kind of the, the central hub. Um, after the tickets are filed, Invoice Ninja is a really great piece of open source software for dealing with invoicing and, and accounting and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, I'm trying to think of other free and open source software used for management. Um, those are the two big ones that come to mind. Oh, uh, there is, um, I, I, I'm not sure if this is still an, I, I won't say, we, we, can, we can talk afterwards, but there, is a, uh, there are a couple pieces of software, but I'm not sure if they're still actively maintained or not, so I'm hesitant to say it in a, in a public forum. So what I would here's what I would tell you. What I would tell you is this: If we sit down and if we are having a conversation in the lobby, right, and I said to you, "I have the best malware solution for you. It is fantastic. For only nineteen ninety five, we're going to take your computer. We're going to do a scan to it. It's going to do a three layered approach. What we call the three layer approach to security. It's I, I just make up all this you know buzzword bingo and shoot it in your direction, right?" Maybe 10% of people would be, they came to you and asked the question, so after all, they're probably 50% of the way to a sale. Maybe that works out for you, right? But most people don't respond to that. Most people don't want to be sold to, and that's where salespeople get a bad rap. But the truth is, our salespeople, and I'm biased, right? But our salespeople are awesome. 
because they don't sell to anybody. They, uh, they're, they're just available to, to talk to. If we sat down in the lobby and I said, hey, you know, the other day, I, I have to tell you, there's this great project that, uh, that exists, and it's this thing, and it has this piece of software, and it, you know, it does a really good job because it's, it's not immune to virus or malware, but it's based on this thing called Linux, and you're able to run it on your laptop. And depending on what your workflow it might work for you, I'd be happy to show it to you if you want to check it out and see what you think. That is a way more uh, a, a palatable approach to sales because now I'm not selling you something. I am, you're coming to me with a problem. I'm suggesting a solution, something that I found. But in order for that to be effective, you have to have, one, you have to have extensive knowledge of that product or service, right? The worst thing a salesperson can say is, yeah, I'm not really sure how that works, right? Uh, the second thing is you need to be able to be passionate about yourself. I can tell clients, hey, whatever it is I'm recommending, let me show you how I use it because this is what we run in our office and we don't have any problems. Oh, I, I don't. I don't. I'm very upfront and honest. Uh, in fact, uh, that's that's why sales. That's why consultations are so important to begin with, right? Before we ever roll out a service solution, before we ever roll out an infrastructure solution, the very first thing we're doing is making sure we absolutely understand the client's needs. Uh, and then you need to pair that. Now, so oftentimes, what, what you'll find is you find a solution, it has a couple of caveats to their workflow, but if you're upfront and honest with them about that, they're, they don't care, right? Where the problem comes in is where people promise the moon, and then all of a sudden it comes to deployment time, and all of a sudden that thing that you told them it could do, eh, it doesn't quite work, it's not a totally baked feature, we don't really have time to set it up, or I didn't really have the expertise to, to play with it, and that's where people start to get upset, and then they go, you, you lied to me, you told me you could do this thing, it didn't do that thing. Um, the, the, the answer to how, how to deal with that is to be very open, upfront, and honest with the client. Hey, this is what it will do, and this is not what it will do. Is that an acceptable compromise? And sometimes what you find is uh, you can, you can kind of iterate, right? You take a problem that they thought they wanted one solution for, and you split it up and say, well, what if we did this thing over here to solve that problem and this thing over there to solve that problem? We've done that. Any other questions? That's a great question. How do you train? How do you train people for software compliance? Um, HIPAA is so one of one of the one of the new rules with HIPAA. And I don't remember. It's 2017, 2018 when this went into effect. Fifteen feet from the nearest patient when you're checking in, right? Or nearest paperwork or whatever. We work in all sorts of medical offices that don't have 15 feet from the desk to the front of the door. Like, everybody would be outside in 40-degree weather. It's not possible to be in compliance in some cases, right? Um, the, uh, I, I guess what I would say is, is this. You, so first of all, you need somebody on staff if you're going to deal with those kinds of things, right? So we have a security person on staff, and his function in life is when we get a medical client to say, okay, let's review what the current state of HIPAA is, let's, recur let's, uh, you know, let's review what the, what the requirements are and, and what our job is and how it relates to this specific application, uh, and then they offer that in the, the, when we go to do the, the, the deployment notes, they say, okay, when you go out, here are a couple of things that you need to make sure you hit. And um, what I found with, and we've done everything from, from HIPAA to law offices to banking to the most stringent one is, is we work with some nuclear stuff. And um, in that case, what I found is for the most part, the government will tell you what you need to do if you just ask. And you just say, hey, uh, I'm new to this. This is what we're doing. Uh, I understand these. This is the document that, that has all of these things. We follow it A, B, C, D. Here's something I have a question on, or here is a, a physical constraint I can't get around. What can we do about that? And having that, that dialogue with them, I, I found them to be pretty reasonable and say, eh, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Mountain of compliance, and a lot of it has nothing to do with the physical security. 
but to instead say, hey, we don't we don't touch the credit card debt that falls over into a GSA thing at your data center. It's like guaranteed compliance. It's not your customer's problem. It's not your problem. It's the problem of those people. But you need to know where that dividing line is and when you need to do that and assess the impact. And to Jim's point, an effective sales method is what I do is I won't directly tell them you can't host it on site. I'll just give them a price. That's enough to convince them. You know, here's here's what here's what it's going to take. You want you're going to have to hire five people. You're going to have to do this. Banking industry very similar, right? Uh, all of the all of the all of the things that they have that 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 have to be in place and separation of of physical machines and encrypted drives and all that stuff. Uh, by the time you get down that list, a lot of times they go, or you could pay twenty nine a month and they'll they'll do all that stuff for you. Uh, we're not, uh, but it's something I would very much be interested in chatting about. Um, the the uh, <laughs> see, see, excellent. You know why? Because Jim earns trust. <laughs> that's, that's that's exactly what it is. Well, so to to kind of come full circle, right? The reason I even know about Sanoid is because I'm walking down the hallway and I'm, I'm looking through, and, and, and this time, right, VMware is really popular and, uh, and, and, and Microsoft is trying to launch, you know, their hyper nonsense. And I walk past and here's Jim sitting at his computer with these four monitors and he's like, here, check this out. I push one button. Here, look, I just, inf I just intentionally infected this Windows box with ransomware. Now watch this. I push this button. Look, the Windows box went back to, to the last snapshot. And I'm like, holy crap, that's cool. Um, yeah, we're not doing, we're not, I would, what, what's interesting to me about Sanoid is that you're doing everything on ZFS, right? And that has a much higher fault tolerance than, than XFS. But right now what we're doing is we're using the snapshot feature built into Versh, um, which is, I admit, not as ideal, um, but it works. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trust. Okay, mm -hmm. so first of all, <clears throat> exactly, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. That is, that, is a, that is a thing that they use to try to get you to buy a different device. But the truth is, the HIP, there's no such thing as a HIPAA compliant device. It doesn't exist. HIPAA doesn't certify devices. HIPAA lays exactly right. They lay out specifications and then you have to, you have to meet those specifications. They could care less what device you use to, to, to to, to get there. Um, the answer to that, how you deal with that, is to, again, yeah, man, that is, if you're not on, if, you're, if you can't go have a company, this is why I, we tend to, we branched out a little bit into trying to do remote support, and we do, it, we do it if people approach us, we don't actively sell it, and that is why, because I need to be able to walk into the client's office and say, listen, here's where the, here's where the breakdown is. You already hit the answer earlier, it's trust. That customer needs to trust you. Yep. That's right. Yeah, it's just very difficult to establish that level of trust, especially when, and I mean, there are some dirty, dirty deals. So they have, you know, especially when you have these vendors that are selling a software and then pretend to say that something that they're not affiliated with at all, uh, you know, isn't there. What you find out is usually if you dig into it a little bit, there's usually a backdoor connection somewhere, right? Either another part of their company installs it, either they offer it as a side service, or they're partnered with somebody that, you know, where they... Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a super frustrating situation. It's also something just totally unrelated to this talk whatsoever. <clears throat> it's also something that we need to be aware of. If you're doing managed service providing, um, you need to be watching what the market is doing because right now, you know, McDonald's and, and, and Sport Clips and, and all these large uh, chains essentially 
are trying to centralize their IT with big, big, big MSPs that are, that are centrally located. And it, in the next five to ten years, I'd say it's going to really start to challenge uh, the little guys that are, that are local and in town. We negotiated a contract with Wyndham to handle the Wi-Fi stuff. And the application was like 170-some pages long. And because they want you to be at the scale that you're able to support any Wyndham hotel across the country. Now, the reality is uh, they just send sales leads, and so you can just deny them. But to, to, just to pace people, a team of people, for two months to sit down and collect information to fill out paperwork to get your foot in the door, that's not something that a lot of, that, 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 that a lot of small guys are going to be able to handle. It's a key part of our revenue stream to the point that it was worth it for us. But um, keep an eye on that. If you're thinking about going into managed service providing, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying have a plan of how you're going to address the fact that there are big national companies that are going to compete with you and they're going to negotiate contracts far beyond your ability to negotiate. Um, our core competency is, again, coming on site and coming alongside that client. I don't think we are structured, and I don't know that I am interested in restructuring us to try to compete on, on a national level, right? So what does the future look like? Probably more specialized, uh, probably more specialized consulting, specialized con uh, you know, deployments and stuff like that. Uh, things that larger MSPs aren't going to uh, be able to, to, to do. The other thing, and I'm not afraid to admit this, uh, we also work with major uh, national uh, managed service providers and say, hey, uh, we'll subcontract for you. Because at the end of the day, if we know that a given portion of our business is going to be sucked up by that entity, well, then I'm going to go make sure that my, I'm at least in decent graces with that entity so that we can, have, we can try and fight for a piece of the pie back. Um, but it is, an active, it is something that I'm actively watching and I'm actively concerned about. And so, yeah, we're absolutely taking steps to try to say what can we do to, to leverage the market or kind of reposition ourselves to make sure that we, we're still viable uh, when, when this, these changes start to make. The, the, the thing that you're always going to have as a local guy, right, these, the, the large MSPs, they can never get equipment on time. And, it, it, like, we had a business call us, and they were a client, and they, they were forced to go with an MSP. Uh, for part of their network, we still handled the, the, the admin side, but all the guest stuff was handled by, by a major uh, national company. They had a problem with one of their core devices, and they just said, well, we'll overnight you one, but it's Friday, so probably won't get there till Monday or Tuesday. What are we supposed to do until then? We have guests. We have people that are, ah, sorry, nothing we can do, right? So they called us back and said, you know, screw it. We don't care. We'll just, we can't run a business like this. And so then they fought, you know, through their chain thing. But that's a unique example. Uh, but that's one thing that you can do is, as, as a local guy, be available. And it, either you get the client or you at least can pick up some of the subcontracting. Cool. Oh. Uh, invoice management. Mm -hmm. Is it really easy to do, like, ad hoc, you know, one-off invoice? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's all web-based. And it... Um, it, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it, it's scalable, right? So there's the, the entry thing, which is completely free, uh, just lets you essentially create invoices. If you pay for the pro version, then you get white labeling, and so it, it does all the white labeling for you, plus you have the ability to do inventory and, and a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, if you just want to create a basic invoice, although I'm not afraid to admit, also, when we started, I had a, a, an open office template, and I would physically type in, in a, inside of a little table, this is the product, that's the price, and there was no inventory. The inventory was in my noggin, and I went, well, I sell one of those. Guess I have one less of those. Should probably order one more of those. That was inventory. Please, yeah. Microsoft Access. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> awesome. Yeah. 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 I mean, we all started somewhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially what we have, we, we call it an initial deployment, uh, initial deployment worksheet. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a piece of paper that every, every time we go out on site, that piece of paper has to be filled out by a technician top to bottom. Um, and that the, well, the very first time we go out, there's a site survey that says what's here. But the initial deployment is here are all of the things we have done. And so there's documentation all the way around. And every time we have a binder on each site, uh, that has all of the documentation in it. Of course, we have a copy of it as well. And in our agreement, in, our, in all of our contracts, we retain the right to keep that information uh, as documentation for seven years, which 
I was told by a lawyer is what we need to do to make sure that we don't get sued if they fire us and then come back and want information that we don't have. I couldn't, he couldn't really give me a real metric as to why that there's that seven year period, but that's what he said, so I'll pass it on. Uh, say again? Yeah, but we don't, I mean, we don't keep patient information, right? But, but anyway, all the documentation is, is, is kept in. Every time we make a change to anything, documentation is put into that binder and left on site, <clears throat> as well as we keep an internal copy, usually just in the ticket notes. It's, hey, we changed the password to this thing, or we you know, set the IP address to that thing, or whatever. By the way, one other thing, because <laughs> I was talking to a guy, and this, this bit him hard. Have a copy of your static IP address assignments. Don't trust the DHCP in the router to, to, to keep track of all that. That's fine for if you want to manage it that way. The do, that's not documentation. So, side hallway track. Do you ever get the, uh, I'm starting to see this more and more, especially with Western Ohio, do you ever get the what happens if you have bus questions? Oh, yeah, all the time. But I have an answer to that. Um, the, you know, what we tell people is, first of all, I'm not the only one working there. So there's plenty of people, and there's somebody right ready to, to, to come over here. We'll have somebody the same day. The other part of that is, and this, this is one of the reasons, some places will do a thing where they assign a given technician to the same client. So every time that client calls, that te the same technician goes out, and they, they feel like they able to bond and stuff like that. I understand that. I try to rotate people around. And so every couple times, the, the client never gets used to seeing only one person. And I like to be the person that's on site the least because that avoids that exact syndrome of what if you get hit by a bus. I don't really think to ask the question because it's always somebody else that's, that's coming in to fix it. So it kind of speaks for itself. Um, but I also have partnered with another uh, managed service provider that does uh, local but does the same thing that we do. And I, we just kind of have a gentleman's agreement that, hey, if something happens, here's the keys to the kingdom, here's how you get them, and so if, if something happens, this is, the, this is the plan of action, make sure that, you know, all these clients aren't up a creek without a paddle, uh, and that we've just kind of worked that out because we've been friends for years. But, but, uh, but yeah, have a plan on what to do, and if you don't have a plan, at least have, uh, at least get, put enough documentation that the client can formulate a plan in the event of your unlikely death. I, have a, I actually, uh, I had to see if I could have a book that sure. that question. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You just need a link to put that in there. One of your first steps is you don't give him the root password. Right. If this person can't come in and look and say, okay, I'll reboot you into rescue mode and reset the root password, right. you're done with that in 10 minutes, yep. out the door. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you go above and beyond trying to get rid of yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, yeah I, I, I've not gone so far as... Say again? In other words, if they can't break the system, they're not allowed to back up. Right, sure. If they can't, then no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. All right, I think we're out of time, but uh, thank you very much. I'll stick around if there's any other questions. We'll, we'll take them.